get started with the lecture because I've got to define some terms I never actually I didn't actually define to begin with. Uh, so we're writing programs, which are basically you know these sets of instructions that your computer is going to carry out. Okay, um, and basically these are a list. This is from Think Java, but he, or sorry, Think Python. But here's a bunch of like things that are con that are constants in the computer program. They you get input from somewhere. Right, either be, it's either going to be from the keyboard, some file, or some other some way. You're going to get data in some way, right? And then you're going to eventually probably send that. You probably want to do something with the data. You can output it to a file, right? Right. Your computer might just not do anything except have another file magically appear somewhere, right? It might show you something on the screen, right? In you know, in CSI and all the and NCIF and all those other. Shows they like have big flashy lights and stuff on computers. That typically it's typically much more mundane than that, as you are well aware. Um, performing basic mathematical operations, most computers, oh, sorry, most programs will do some kind of math. But fortunately, you don't have to be particularly good at math. Like a mathematician, they typically take some hardcore stuff like uh, dif you know Diffie cube differential equations. I've never taken differential equations in my life. What I do is that I simply estimate. But if you hand me those kinds of problems, I'll tell the computer to estimate it as close as possible so that I don't actually solve it, I just give it a really good guess, and the guess is indistinguishable from the real answer, so it doesn't matter, right? So math, you, so when you're using a computer, the mathematics can be a bit more flexible sometimes. Uh, conditional execution, checking things against, uh, you know, against conditions. So some of you were checking out if-else statements, you know, if this, do that, otherwise do that, and then repetition. Um, and that's pretty much the components in some way, shape, or form of every single program. Okay, uh, doing input and output, doing some math, uh, uh, doing some branching, in other words, in, in, or that's what they mean by conditional execution. Like doing this, or doing this, or doing this. It's in some sh way, shape, or form. And then repeating stuff, doing stuff until you know some condition is typically reached. Um, so we also talked about an algorithm. So an algorithm is what we is that is what we and, and it was what a program implements. An algorithm can be much more. It, the the you, if you've cooked, you've dealt with an algorithm. It's a recipe essentially. But for computers, with algorithm algorithms are a bit more well defined. We say that basically algorithms they take step by step. So if you remember, like your computer, it would do the first line, then the second line, then the third line. It wouldn't randomly do the third line, then the second, and then the first, or some other order. It's not going to switch it up on you. So it's going to go in order. So, so algorithms are in order. They're step by step. They're unambiguous. That's a big thing. Language, uh, Human language is ambiguous. When we're dealing with algorithms and programming languages, ambiguity is a bad thing. It can be pot. And as we know, like ambiguity can be lethal in some cases, right? So um, programming, everything has to be specific. And if it's not specific, it might cause an error. So. It's unambiguous statements that will eventually go and produce a result, right? So these are step-by-step -step in instructions. They're unambiguous. They will produce. Uh, they're well. So uh, the term for step-by-step -step is well-ordered, unambiguous, right? Well-ordered meaning there's an order in which stuff will appear. Okay. Um, now, what makes programming so programming itself the concepts aren't actually too hard right we just went over i just told you what they were it's branching math and re repeating so what makes it hard well you make it hard uh specifically that bit of gray matter in your head uh you see you are your own worst enemy because you are human and so am i and i am and we are all flawed uh right have you ever seen like the the, the uh You'd be surprised how often, though, that things like this happen, where you transmute two letters, right? Where you accidentally uh, put in letters twice, right? That you, I, I, I was here, and I one of the, the first examples I did was I, what if I accidentally do pint instead of print, right? Doing something like that, especially when you're doing a word that you might not necessarily know how to spell, like necessary, right? You might spell that here one line, and then later you might go necessary right or necessary even right it's very easy to make a mistake like that or to do where you have a variable which I'll get into that's just a name for 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 something where you might call it some variable 
once, and then maybe later you accidentally call it some variable, or you call it some variable, right? So those kind of things, you know, happen. So what, how do you fix these things? Debugging. Uh, there's basically three types of errors that you'll have. The first is a syntax error, which is where basically you have a grammatical mistake. In formal language, we're pretty forgiving about those, right? Um, and we've got, uh, so here, like it says, one plus two is illegal, is completely legal, but eight, open close parenthesis, is illegal because parentheses have to come in matching pairs, right? English, we can, uh, we can tolerate a lot of syntax errors, right? Uh, in fact, a lot of them sometimes get in grammatical errors. In fact, like, I can't adult today, right? That it's not grammatically correct, but language evolves and it's fine, right? You totally understand what I, what I mean, what would you, what I would mean if I was your friend and I said I can't adult today, right? So um, Python, on the other hand, is not forgiving as soon as it sees a single syntax error, where basically, like an example of that was like splitting it up into a, you know something into a separate line. Uh, that can be an issue. Um, now, it will take you, the first time you hit errors, any type of error, it will take you a while to track it down, uh, unless you call me over and I'll probably fix it in three minutes. The difference is, is that you've made that mistake once, probably. I've made that mistake 500 times, so it means I fixed it 500 times, which means I'm pretty good at fixing these mistakes. It's not that I don't make these mistakes anymore. I will make a ton of mistakes in front of you, and not deliberately. Um, the difference is, is that I fixed them before, so I'll just instantly just go back and fix them. So that's one syntax errors. Uh, runtime errors, these are these happen um, because there wasn't a syntax error. So your program appears good, and then some kind of like logical thing happens that, that doesn't work, or you try to do something that doesn't exist. Runtime errors, they're not gonna see them for right uh, right now quite yet. They'll 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 happen when like when you're like trying to when something isn't undefined and you're trying to pass it around and then do stuff with something that's undefined. Like it's like passing around and like it's accidentally like setting a variable to not a number, right? Nan, you remember that? Like it's not infinity, it's nan. You accidentally set some number to not a number and then try to pass it into an equation. Of course it's gonna come out with gibberish. And semantic errors are the third type which are the most insidious, which is that uh, your computer is an evil genie. It will do exactly what you tell it to do. Exactly. And this includes, so you may have told it to do something that you didn't intend it to tell. Like, like uh, you may forget, for instance, like going back to our previous program, you might forget that you have a slash T here and then you run it and you're wondering why there's a tab there. Well, you didn't mean to do that. That's a semantic error, right? So you'll want to, so debugging is a bit hard. Well, you'll learn how to do it. There's things called debuggers where you can run through it step by step. You can also print out the progress of your program. Like you can put in print lines to try to execute that. Okay. So, um, so programming languages, these are formal languages that are designed to do uh, computation. And that means we're going to essentially work with data. So uh, right now we've been working with strings. That's, so we're going to go over Three basic types of of, uh, of data to begin with, and we'll work with uh, idle in the shell mode to begin with to go over these things. So let's go over like the different types of data. So first type of data you have are your words, right? Words and characters, and those are surrounded by quotation marks, and we call them strings. And you can do some surprising things with them. Uh, hello, you can actually add two strings to one another uh, to another. Uh, remember, strings have to be in quotation marks. If you don't, it's going to tell you, hey, I'm looking for something called hello. It's not defined, right? Uh, but I could do something like uh, hello plus space there. Notice I had to put in a, notice I put in a space. So I do hello plus there. This is an operation. Addition in this case is, called, is, is an operation called concatenation, where you basically glue two strings together here. And that makes sense how that works. How you have how, how the plus operator in this case means yeah I'd want it hello plus there equals hello there right that makes total sense right in this case one the the word one hundred 
and then let's add um, 200, right? And then I'm going to add the word 3. The way that's going to be defined is it's going to say 100, it's going to glue them all together. 100, 203, right? Same if it was just 100, the word 100, right? And the word 200. Notice that those are words, right? Everybody clear on the fact that these are words I'm adding because they're in quotation marks, right? Now, it glued them together without a space because I didn't put in a space, right? If I wanted the space, I could put a space here or I could put a space here and now we'll have two spaces, right? Right? Two spaces. Um, and most of you should are using, a, I made sure that, just trying to get, make sure that you, most of you are working with what's called a monospaced font, which is, um, you know, those are like those old typewriter fonts, only they look really good nowadays. Um, and that's so that basically every character on your screen takes up the exact same amount of space. So this less than, so this greater than sign takes up the same amount of space as a P. The C takes as much as sign space as a zero, right? The O, everything takes up the same amount of space, and this helps you line up stuff, which is important because a lot of times you're going to have to count spaces. This is especially important in Python once we get into stuff called code blocks. Okay? You also get stuff called um, so, sorry. Did you, so what did you, did you have quotation marks around everything? 100? Nope. nope. There, there we go. So, um, so that's deal. So these things are called strings. Okay. Strings, and they can be any kind of character. Anything that you can type, you can throw into a string. Okay. But obviously, uh, we're dealing with mathematical stuff a lot of the time. So we're dealing with numbers. Now, there's two types of numbers that Java will natively deal with just out of the box. Uh, Integers and floats, okay? Um, integers are the easy numbers that don't have any decimal points or anything, right? One plus two, boom, right? It adds them together and puts them into a three, right? Uh, three minus two gives you one. Six times 700 gives me 4,200, right? Um, Java, unlike other programming languages, doesn't really care how big your numbers get. It automatically resizes how big it needs to be. Right, so that's pretty nice. In other languages, you have to count, consider like the fact that these number that in other programming languages they do stuff like oh some numbers have to be 32 bits. Ints are 32 bits long, meaning they can be up to two billion because that's the biggest num number you can store in a, uh, in a binary in 32 binary digits, or as small as negative two billion. Right, round there. It's like 2.1, but I mean. And then you can go up to longs, which are even bigger. But Java, you don't have to. Sorry, with Python, you don't have to worry about that. It's fantastic. Okay, um, automatically resizes however big they need to be. Okay. Um, note that by then to just step back for a second. Note, can everybody still see? Even though it's down there, I can move the window. Actually, I just realized that. Why not? Do do do. This better for everybody. This work. Okay. So let's go ahead and see. We've also got, um, notice that I could do, what else can, I, so I'm just going to step back for a second, right? We could add hello. Can I subtract the word, the letter O from it? No. It says that you can't, so this is an error. And, and when you get errors, you need to, you know, don't just click away from them. Read them. Trace back. Okay. I guess it's like, you know, okay. So some logic says tracing maybe means it's like figuring out what is going on. Like, so tracing back to the error. The most recent call last. Okay, so that helps you know that basically that the last thing in this list is the most recent thing you did. The file, pi shell. So we're working in the Python shell, so it's probably not actually working in the files, working in the shell. Line one, okay, well, each line by line. So, oh, there's the line I typed, hello minus O. It says it's a type error. Unsupported operand types for minus, string and string. Right, if you remember back from algebra, you've got your operators, right, which are like the plus, minus, multiply, and stuff, and then you've got the operands. So it says, so it's unsupported operand. You can't, this makes sense, you can't subtract a stir from a stir. String, this is what you, what string is stored as. Programmers are lazy. This is a common recurring theme. Programmers are lazy, so they use str for string, as the shorthand for string. You can't subtract two strings from each other. But you can multiply a string uh, with a number. Which is actually something you can can't do in other in some other programming languages like Java, and that makes sense. Hello times three gives you hello hello hello, 
right? That makes total sense that you can do that, right? So we do try. So Python's pretty good at only trying at, at making sure you only get things that are given sets. So with integers, you're given your standard operand operators and operands. You've got four plus five, right? You've got four minus five, so it does negative numbers just fine. You've got four times negative uh, twenty. Okay. So one of the key now now we're going to get into sorry and then for exponentiation so like you know two squared which would give you four right you use instead of doing the caret symbol over here right this is normally how you write uh, two squared right instead in Python we use two of those so this is two squared uh, two raised to the sixth power is sixty four. Right, that's two times two times two times two times two times two. So that's 64. Okay. So division is where things get a bit complicated because it's different than other programming languages. Now, in most programming languages, uh, and that's because Python does it the logical way, the way that most people assume. So, like, if I do uh, 100 divided by four, it tells me 25.0. Um, if I do 100 divided by 3, it tells me 33.333333, right? It gives me, like, what you'd get on a calculator, right? Although it gave me 25.0 here. This is gets us into our third type, which is called a floating point number. Floating point numbers are those numbers that have decimals, a floating point in them. So 25.31 uh, plus 2 gives me 27.31. You add an integer to a floating point number, the floating is automatically going to convert to a floating point number. We'll get into the specifics of floating point numbers in a bit, but just note that when you divide, unlike in other programming languages, Java is going to give you a floating point, is going to give you a floating point number. Now, this is a pain in the butt for most beginner programmers because in most programming languages, you'll get something like this. Okay, 24, 100 divided by, if I do two slashes, it does what's called integer division which is what happens in most programming languages. So, for instance, 100 divided by 75, that's one in change, right? One in bit. If I do this, integer division, it gives me one, right? This is the kind of the exact amount of time 75 can go into, into 100, right? It can go in there once and it just throws out the extra bit. It's like the fourth grade mathematics that you learned, right? It's like... It would be set, it, this 70, 100 divided by 75, according to fourth grade rules, right, is 1, remainder 25. Everybody remember that? Which brings me to the next operator, which is actually ridiculously useful. The remainder operator, or the uh, modulo operator. So the, percent, the percentage sign means uh, is called modulo, or mod, for short. 100 mod 75 gives me the remainder of 100 divided by 75. Now you might wonder, why in the world do we want this? Well, it's useful for doing something, some a lot of mathematical operations. Like, say I want to know what the last digit of this number is, okay, or any number is. Well, I can mod it by 10. What's the remainder after dividing it by 10? Well, it's going to be the last digit, and so it gives me the last number. What about the last two digits of a, bu of a bunch of stuff? The last two digits? And this will be necessary for one of the assignments you do, by the way. 17. That's pretty cool. So it's useful. So the modulo operator gives you the remainder. So we've got, so let's go and list them out. You've got plus, you've got minus, you've got divide, you've got times. Well, let's do times, exponentiation, divide, integer division. And then we've got mod. So six. You've got six of these operators to do, deal with. Okay? And you can use the, in between these, you can, is it seven? It is seven. Seven. So, yeah, because I forgot about the exponentiation. But we don't use that too much, so that's fine. But exponentiation exists. Uh, you've got, so these are all operators that you can do. Uh, and you can use basically Java, uh, Python is a super powerful calculator. So that's integers. Um, floating point numbers, um, they're defined by a specific IEEE format, meaning they're, every computer makes sure that in store floating point numbers in a specific way. They're stored in binary, right? Which means that you get sometimes interesting issues, right? Like, take 
the whole one divided by three issue, right? That zero point a bunch of threes. Now typically there's technically, right, since this is a fraction, one over three, there's an infinite number of threes, but there's only but it, on a calculator, right, there's only so much space to store the number of threes. Right? So when you do two divided by three, it gives you, you know, oh sorry, two divided by three, it gives you a bunch of sixes. And on a calculator it might round up or something. Now with floating point numbers, it can be a bit weird because these numbers are being converted into binary. Binary, okay, means that essentially these are numbers are represented between with only zeros and ones. Okay? For instance, right, a decimal system, you can use any of these ten digits to represent a number, right? A, a number. A bit is short for a binary digit. So if we say a four-bit number, that means it's made up of four binary digits, zeros and ones. So this is zero. This is one, right? So this is the ones place. This is the twos place. And this is the fours place. So two is this in binary. Three is this in binary. Now that might not make sense, when I'm talking about the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, but let's go ahead and talk about uh, actual, you know, you know, four uh, four digit numbers. Like this is nine, this is a thousand and nine, right? And let's break this into parts, right? One thousand and nine, right, is made up of four parts. It's made up of a thousand, right? Plus zero, plus zero, plus nine. See, and now if we change this to 1,239, it's made up of 1,000 plus 200 plus 30 plus 9, right? No, nothing magical over here. This is a typical, you know, four-digit number, right? If we abstract this out, out, out further, though, right, it's 1 times 10 to the third power, right? 1 times 1,000. I'll go ahead and just use 1,000 here. Plus 2 times... 100, right, plus 3 times 30 plus, so 3 times 10 plus uh, 9 times 1, right? So you've got the tens, the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place, and the thousands place, and they're all multiplied by whatever number occupies them at the moment, right? Okay, nothing too scary there, and we can, you know, this is technically 1, and I'll just do the exponentiation that I was talking about. 10 to the third power plus 2 times 10 squared, right, plus 2 times, sorry, 3 times 10 to the first power plus 9 times 10 to the zeroth power. And 10 to the zero, and anything to the zeroth power always goes to 1, right? So again, you don't need to know basic math. You don't need to necessarily have to know too much math for this course. Um, but that's kind of, so. Now let's see. Apply this to like uh, to a number like this. Okay, one zero one one. So this is the right. So this is the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, and then the eighths place. Right? Why is it the eighths place? Well, because this was over here, ten to zero with. 10 to the first, 10 to the second, 10 to the third. This is 2 to the zero, 2 to the first, 2 to the second, 2 to the third. 1 times 2 to the third power plus 0 times 2 to the second power plus 1 times 2 to the first power plus 1 times... Um, one, you know, it's one, one times two to the zero power. All right. So this is how integers are stored in your in your program. This sorry. This is how integers get stored in your program and on your computer, right? They they just get stored like this. Decimal points, on the other hand, uh, I triple E loading point representation, right, are defined by um, IEEE 734, and it uses a bunch of ones and zeros in a, 
Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. Come on. Normally they have a nice big image as to like how stuff happened in there. I triple E. Okay, I have to use the actual term double. I triple E double precision uh, floating point format, and they use this is how they use 64-bit numbers. Okay, so they have 64 zeros and ones to de dedicate to a number, right? They use a sign, then they have a uh, Basically, one digit to tell whether or not the pos the, it's positive or negative, right? You can use zero to represent a positive number and one to represent a negative number. Then you have an exponent, which can be positive or negative, which tells you, which you plug into this equation over here. And that tells you how, what power it's raised to. And then it's got the fraction, in other words. But notice that the fraction has 52 bits. Now, this means that unlike the integers in, in, in uh, Python, there's only so much space you can store stuff. And because it's being stored with ones and zeros, some funny things sometimes happen with, with floating points in a programming language. For instance, one plus, right, one plus zero plus two point zero, that doesn't really do anything. But if I do this, zero point one plus zero point two, it gives me zero point three and a lot of zero, something that's really, really close to point three. Right, but this is just rounding error from the fact that I'm storing these things in a, I'm storing decimal numbers, right, in a binary format, and then converting that decimal, that binary format into a decimal representation. Now, that was a long and roundabout way of saying that sometimes with floating point numbers, you don't get what you expect, and that's okay. Okay, so sometimes you might go, oh, there's a little bit of there, and just so long as you know it exists. It's okay, and you may have to address it if you're like multiplying them by huge numbers, but otherwise these minor errors don't matter too much. So, yes? Does that mean, is it wise to avoid using floating point numbers and to use just really big integers instead? Only if you're dealing with money. Only if you're dealing with money. Uh, because that, that can otherwise be a pain in the butt. But otherwise, use, no, use, it's safe to use floating point numbers. Uh, it's safe to use these things, especially because these things generally get ironed out. So 0, 1 plus 0 0.2 plus 5, they, 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 they show up on edge cases, essentially, right? And, that, and that, that works out just fine. So they show up on edge cases, and it also means that when I bang out a number like this also, because there's only so much space, right? It's going to convert it into a scientific. Uh, it's going to convert it into essentially scientific notation, right? Ten, some number times ten to the forty-fourth power, right? There's only so much. It only saves only so many significant figures, right? Which is perfectly fine because that happened in science, and these amount of zeros are typically more than you can get with your instruments, right? Typically, you can get six significant figures, and here I've got. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, more, so that's much more. So it's no problem that floating point numbers have these things. Except when they are, but they're not going to be a problem in this class. Okay, so you've got your floating point numbers, and you can do pretty much anything you need with them as well, right? You can even do the remainder operation. So 5.0, so 100 and 1 mod 5.0 gives you remainder of one, okay? So important thing to know is that when you're dealing is that is conversions. Um, integers automatically get converted to floats when you, when, you have a, when you have a float on one side of the operator, right? So here I've got 3279 times 3.0, right? And it converts 3279 into a floating point whenever I deal with an, uh, an integer. Sorry? Yeah, there's an so we can turn things floats into ints, but that's well, I'll get into that in a bit. So basically, whenever but whenever you interact with them natively like this, uh, that's what happens. So all these things I've been typing out, these are what we call expressions. Okay, everything in Java is an sorry, everything in Java, but also in Python is an expression. Uh, 
So in expressions, what happens to expressions? They evaluate. In other words, they condense down to a single answer, right? So I can make these things as, as big as I like, um, and they'll condense down into an expression. Um, now, how do they get, uh, they, do they compress down? Well, order of operations, right? So if you remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, all the way back from whenever you had to memorize that. But that's what goes on over here, right? It scans through, it deals with multiplication and division from left to right, uh, and then it did the addition operation. So three, so right, two plus five, uh, three times five, it'll do three times five first for 15, and then add the two to it, which will bring me to 17. Now, if I add parentheses on the other hand, 2 plus 3 times 5, it'll give me 5 times 5, which is 25. Right? Makes sense? So it's just the exact same operations you would do on a calculator. Right? No different. So what makes this stronger than a, than a uh, calculator? What makes it more useful? And that's <laughs> variables, which is that we can take answers and we can store them in variables. Okay? Um, for instance, you like basic variables are like x, right? It's very annoying to have to like retype numbers, right, in, into the equation whenever you use them. So it's nice to be able to uh, to, to be able to like store them somewhere. So here I'm saying x is equal to 60, and now when I say print x, I get 60 out. So that's how easy it is to create variables. In Python, it's super simple. You just simply say what the name of the variable is, my variable. And you say it's equal to something. And you can put whatever you want in there. Right? My variable. And then I can just say, hey, since I'm in a repl, I can just type that. But if I was in a script, I'd have to type, you know, I'd have to type print my variable. And it would print out foo. Right? So what happens in expressions is that basically like this, 60 plus 5, so well, x plus 5, what happens is that it, to evaluate this line, it looks at the x. It says, well, what's stored in x? Right? What happens is that I like create a little box. Your computer like creates a little box and stores 60 inside of it, and it labels the box x. And then when it sees an x in an expression, it goes, OK, I need to open box x. It opens it up and says, ah, it's 60 in there, so I'm just going to replace whatever's in there with 60. Um, sorry, 60. I think I just erased it accidentally, so x plus 5. So that will give me 65. Cool. Um, not only that, I can update the value. I can say x is equal to 61. Whoops, sorry. x is equal to 61. Note that it just said unexpected indent. It's very touchy about having spaces at the beginning, which we'll get into. OK. So, so now x is 61. And that's pretty nice. Uh, so another thing to note is that while I can add strings together, like I can do x if I did x plus my variable, it's going to give me an error. It says you can't add ints and strings together, right? And that and in other programming languages you kind of can, but here what you have to do is that you have to convert them. So if I wanted, uh, so I could use a function called str to convert anything into in that. So I go str, and that takes my 61 and turns it into a string. And now I can concatenate it with my variable and say 61 foo. Okay. So variables are pretty powerful. You can name them anything you want. Well, no, I can't actually name them anything I want. Okay. There are legal variable names, and then there's illegal variable names. For instance, I can't name a variable 100. Can't assign to a literal. Can't name it one, one name in valid syntax. Variables can't start with a number. Variables can't start with the number. They have to start with a um, with a letter, but they can't. But they can have a uh, number in them. You can mix capitalization and lowercase, but Java is what we call. Oops. So a three is equal to three, right? But Java is very picky about. Uh, about whether or not you're using uppercase or lowercase numbers, right? No A3 exists. Um, they have to start. They can start with an underscore, which is this is a terrible variable name, by the way. 
these all these variable names are coming up with are terrible. You should use something like, um, you know, like acceleration if you're talking about acceleration, right? Right. Um, you can also use, as I mentioned, you can use pretty much anything you need as a variable. So here I switched to Japanese and I just simply said um, height. And then I switch back because otherwise my equal to bot four, it had no problem with it. And then if I say, uh, whoops, so, uh, and then if I recall it, so it's pretty flexible. You can use pretty much, you know, you can use a lot of things for variables, but you can't start them with numbers. It's a, just a rule. Um, you also can't have spaces in your variables. Okay, so A, B, I can't have a variable called A, B, A space B. That's just not going to work. Now, typically what I do, so there's two ways to, if you want to have spaces, though, there's typically two ways to represent them. The first way is camel case. So if you have two words, you start it out lowercase. That's the, by the way, you want to start out your variable names with lowercase letters. That's kind of the unwritten rule. Start out with your, your variables with lowercase. And then when you have another word, you uppercase the first letter of that word. Uh, it's called camel case because a lot of camels have humps, right? Camels have humps, so it looks like you've got a bunch of humps in your letter. But it makes it easy to, it makes it fairly easy to parse. The other popular way to do it is to use underscores. Right? And you can use those to separate your letters. So it works out fairly well to do that. Okay. So those are variables, um, and they're extremely powerful for what, for what you can do. Um, now let's take a look at like actually like using them in a um, in a in a script, right? I could do something like uh, now we can do something a bit more complicated with our hello world program. We can create a, a program. Let's call it Echo. So print. I will repeat what you say. Okay. So now we can use uh, res uh, response. I'll create a variable called response, which will store the user input. Okay, and input over here, and we'll we'll just take input, and we won't bother repeating that. Uh, sorry, we we'll just get input from the user, and then we'll print it out. And then we can print it. So what we can do is we can put resp uh, response inside of print. And that, right, remember what print does over here. It prints out what was ever in quotation marks. Well, this is what we call a string literal, meaning it's a, oh, sorry, yeah, you can close the door. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, let's close the door also. So um, I will repeat what you say. So we can, so this evaluates. And it says, oh, there's a string there. And then it's going to also evaluate response and say, oh, there's a string there. We'll print out that string. So we need to save it. Let's move it to, um, yeah, I need to create a new folder so that I can. So I'll be uploading, all the code will get uploaded online. So let's go ahead and new folder, ITP, intro to Python. Um, let's call it. Echo, py. Okay, I will repeat what you say. And notice it's waiting for me to type something. Right, and it just so notice that the text I entered was in black, and it printed out in blue. Okay, and we can make a um, and we can 
make a quick modification to you to this back to you. So this is it's much better to write your programs in a script rather than using the uh, IDE because then you'd have to go back and rewrite three lines in order to do that, and that's kind of annoying. I will repeat what I say back to you. So there we go. So, um, so now there's so now let's go over another thing that I think is useful. So not only can we like store variables. So not so here's so not only can I use variable to st store stuff. I you know that's essentially like creating a mem you know like basically creating random. I'm storing random pieces of data, right? And not only can I store data, I can store commands because we're lazy and we don't like repeating. So right now we're going to go over basic functions, which is a bit, it goes a bit ahead of the book, but I feel like it's not that hard to understand and it's pretty easy to deal with, um, especially since we've been dealing with kind of, we've been talking about variables and stuff. It kind of works just hand in hand. So let me like try like a basic, um, I'm going to create a basic program that will create a spaceship, okay, for ASCII art. Spaceship.py. All right. So spaceships are kind of, um, you know, let's go ahead and just show you, like, it's pretty easy to create ASCII art. Uh, spaceship, if I recall, is like, you know, let's go ahead and, they're, they're, rocket ships are pretty, you know, straightforward. They're like a cone on top, and then there's squares, and other squares, and other cylinders and stuff, and then they've got, like, the bits of fire coming out of them and launching them into space. So let's just start by making the cone, right? We've got uh, got that, and we've got uh, the slash, but I need two of them, right? Because I'm so I'm going to create a cone, right? I need two sla slashes over here to represent that space. Uh, then I'm going to copy, and I'm going to paste this over here, right? Copy and paste is fan uh, is a fantastic tool. Um, delete a space there, add two spaces over here, and that over there, and you can kind of see how I'm kind of making a cone. Right? Okay, so I've kind of made a basic cone head right over there. So now I can create a divider, I think. So let's see. And then for division for dividing stuff, I will um you know use the equal signs to divide that. If I print right, if I run this now, it's gonna print out just that. And I think I've got one too many equal sign in there. That's fine. Why do I have one too many equal sign in there? Because these, because these are messing me up, right? The, the black slashes are messing me up. So okay, that's pretty cool. All right, so now I can create a start make, working on the box, right? And I'm going to use the bar symbol over here, so the vertical bar, so that shift and the and backslash is the key above it. Enter, right? And you're probably wondering why I'm doing something so silly, actually, right now. Um, put those there. And then I'm going to do another divider. OK. Right. Right? Something like that. And then copy and paste the whole, this a whole bunch of times, right? And then uh, this, but I think maybe like in reverse, or the, so. Let's see. Yeah, that should do, right? So, um, right. So we've got a rocket going, and maybe I've got too many spaces over here. I honestly, I feel like I've got too many spaces over here. Right? I've got too many dividers. Oh, that's a bit of a pain, right? I have to go through and I have to change all these dividers in there, right? If I want to, if I want to condense it down to to this thing, right? So, copying and pasting worked to an extent, right? Um, okay, so that looks a bit more like a big, long rocket. More like a firework, to be honest. It's okay. But I'm getting my coin across, and I don't even know how many, like, sections I built this up to. Right? So what we can do, and I mean, this is a valid program, but what we can do to make it a bit better is that we can basically break it down into component parts, right? We had this part, right? We had the top of the ship, and then we have our dividers, Right, and then we have the launching. So what we can do is that we can create, we can basically create a command that will do these for us, uh, a function. So to create a function, 
it looks like this. These are this is the way you basically add new commands in the Python. You say def, which stands, is short for define or define function, and then you give it a name. Let's call it uh, print top. And then you, once you're done with the name, you just put parentheses. This means it won't take in any input. You just call it as it is, and it will execute and run automatically. Then colon on next to next to there. And this is where the indentation comes in. So it automatically indented it for me. And indentation, and now I'll just copy paste and paste this part off out of here, and paste these into here. So and I'll indent them all. So notice how we have basically all the print statements indented into here. Okay, we have all the statements indented over. So what I've done is that I've defined a function called print top, and when I when I use run the command print top, it will call uh, it will call a you know this line and print out a slash and a backslash. It'll send, print out another slash and a backslash, and it'll print out another slash and a backslash. The only variation is is that those uh, differ by the amount of space. Now if I run this program, it's not going to actually print out the backslash. Why? Because what I've done is I've defined something, but I haven't actually said how to use it, right? I haven't actually said to use it yet. So to use it, all I have to do is over here in the main block of code, which is the furthest left indentation, right? So we know these commands are part of print top because they're in indented into print top. So now I can type print top, and with and the difference between a variable and a function, the way Java knows you want a variable or a function, is whether or not you have parentheses, right? Right? Because the mathematical functions, like f of x, remember they'll have parentheses in them. So now I run this, and it printed out the top again. So now let's clean this up. We can take uh, this part and call and say uh, def print box, right? And that's just going to be Let's say a, you know, a box like this. And you know what? Maybe I will have these uh, extra sections in there. Right? Maybe I'll have a top and a bottom. But, and now what I can do is that this program will start cleaning up really well. So I can delete all of these. Shoot. And I can go print box. Right? And print out one box. I'd like a lot of boxes, so I can copy and paste. So now I'm printing out five boxes, right? I know it's a bit easier to count five of these out, right? Right? And then I can do a def print bottom. Again, I'm drawing stuff from later from later chapters. You probably won't need functions to complete your homework at all, but they're there to just. I feel I normally introduce them from the very beginning, so it feels weird for me not to introduce them because they go into functions and they're all their details. And I'm just talking about functions that simply execute print statements that do basic, basic, basic things. Okay, uh, we have a print bottom, right? Print top, print bottom, uh, print bottom. So this is the typical way a Python program works. You define a bunch of functions and then you just call them. Um, and as you'll learn later, right, instead of just doing this, because we've copy pasted a one a line, bit, you can also eventually, we'll learn how to specify uh, how to repeat these things. So for blank in range, let's say we want seven boxes, so or 10 boxes, so we just say we want 10 of them. And now our program got condensed a whole lot more, 10 boxes. So this just simply says for blank in range, I can put anything I want there, but blank just simply means I don't care what I put in there. Range 10, obviously that means do 10. there's a range of 10 things I want to do. And now I can put whatever I want in there. 321, right? And that's a pretty big rocket ship. 
Um, I don't think I'm an infinite loop. There we go. See, it ended. It just takes a while for stuff to print out. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to print out there. So you can, um, so functions are fairly straightforward. And this is what we call a for loop. We learned that much. We go into detail in that later. It's unnecessary for a lot of the homeworks I'm going to assign for you uh, to begin with. But we can break stuff into functions. All right. So let's see. So we've learned. Oh, see, they did functions fairly easy on too, uh, early on too. So Java, the reason I, is it's good to introduce them because uh, with Java, sorry, with Python, there's a lot of built-in functions, right? We saw one of them with the uh, with print. Print is a function. It's a command that's added it, that Java auto, sorry, that Python automatically has. Teach, so used to teaching Python, uh, to teaching Java. So I keep saying Java. All right. Um, even though I like Python a whole lot more, so such as much. So input is another function. Um, run Python shell. Okay. Uh, another function is the int function, which will take if you put in a floating point number, it'll turn it into an integer. Or let's see, does this work? Four. You throw a string in it, and if their string has a number, it will turn it into a number. Right? Of course, if I throw in 3a, it's going to say, what are you talking about? That doesn't work. Right? Um, there's also a float, which takes anything and turns it into a float. So it turns 3 into 3.0. It'll take a, if it takes some text in, right? So you can see how that's useful. That just takes text and it turns it into, an, into a number. Right? So you can actually add it with other numbers. So there's a lot of other uh, stuff built into that. Um, there's a lot of nice functions built into that. So let's go ahead and see what I've got for our next, for my other assignment. I didn't think we'd get this far, but whatever. It's good to go faster than to go slower and then back up as necessary. Okay, so let's go ahead, So because I posted three assignments, so let's go ahead and go over this last one. I think it was meant to be later, but whatever. Messy chocolate. Now I'll give out due dates. They won't be far. They'll be. I think there's no. I, I, I see no reason why these shouldn't be able to be done by Saturday at the late at the very latest. You know. So this is the first uh, actual assignment. It's called Messy Chocolate um, because it deals with two things: uh, chocolate and a mess of code. It's a Java program. This is what I get for if I put it into Python. Ah. Okay. I'll re-upload this. With, it's supposed to be .py, not .java. Okay. Uh, the first program is uh, about chocolate. Okay. So the, there's something called the Harris-Benedict equation, and that estimates the amount of calories your body needs to maintain your body weight if you don't do any exercise. This is your basal metabolic rate, or BMR. So basically, most of the calories you burn throughout the day, you actually just burn them to keep your heart running, to keep your body warm, you know, to keep your body at the right temperature, to keep your brain thinking. You burn up a lot of calories that way. So estimating that is a bit hard, but there's two different equations. Okay, the formula for calories needed for a woman to maintain. So woman first, the calorie perform. This is the formula for calories. Your BM, your basal metabolic rate is 655 calories plus 4.35 times the weight plus 4.7 times the height minus 4.7 times the age. Now I'd be very cautious about, by the way, copying and pasting these. Uh, these into your just directly copying and pasting these it's easy, it's much quicker if you just type them out rather than copying and pasting the formula because note the dots and the stuff in there because this is formatted like let's see what happens if I try to paste this into notepad <laughs> you end up getting something that looks like uh, this which might not necessarily work for you right uh, and also it, it might not work out I've seen students so that's so it's 4.35 times the weight plus 4.7 times the height minus 4.7 times the age, and the formula for the calories you need for a man is this one below. Okay. Um, also note my footnote that these are in imperial units, so they're non-metric, right? So they're in freedom units as opposed to metric units. Um, the typical meta so free American units. It's a joke. So a typical chocolate bar maintain, it contains 214 calories, okay? 
you typically that's your average chocolate bar, 214 calories. So your program should allow the user to input their weight in pounds, their height in inches, and their age in years. The output is the number of chocolate bars that you need to consume to maintain your weight for both a man and a woman. Say, if you're a woman, you need to have this many chocolate bars per day to maintain your weight. And if you're a man, you need this many chocolate bars to maintain your weight. Make sense? It does, you don't need an if-else statement yet. You don't need it. You, you just simply print out both. For, you don't ask the user's gender. You just simply print out both man and woman, right? Make sense? Okay. Just print out both. That way we don't have to deal with if-else statements yet, okay? That's just a good way of doing this. Uh, next thing is I, last night I wrote this bit of messy code, uh, right? Create a file called messy.py. Copy and paste this code and correct the error so that it, should, so that it runs. You, the code should output 139 when you enter 12, okay? So there's errors in it. I've made a couple of errors in it. Uh, I need you to fix these errors. Uh, right, and then run it, and then there's uh, a math error in there too. So fix those errors, and that's what I need you to do. So we have plenty, I think we have 20 minutes left, so there's plenty of time to get started on these. I'll go ahead and, so you guys can get started. I'm going to go ahead and reformat this and uh, actually correct it and put it online because, you know, I'm showing that I'm an amazingly competent teacher on my first day. Um, <coughs> PY, boom. In case you're curious, uh, I get, I, I, this is how I write my um, documents in LaTeX. So compile, yes, it, my, I, I use a programming language to write my text. Uh, be why? Because most academic papers are submitted using LaTeX. A lot of academic papers are, used, are submitted using LaTeX, and it's just force of habit. And it's very useful for putting in code blocks. Yeah. Can you, what's your preferred addition? Spaces are better. Uh, I prefer tab. So I'm the blasphemer who prefers tabs, but for Python, you need to use spaces because it's that important. It doesn't care. Okay. Okay. It's, the, the, I don't, the rules consistency above all else. So edit, um, edit assignment, delete, okay, and now assign, so now files, upload a new file, browse. And let's make this do Saturday. Yeah, at the end of Saturday. Okay, that's easiest. Okay, and the other ones, obviously, that should be they, that. There's, I don't think there's a need for the due date for them. Um, okay. So. The other thing I should mention is that starting next uh, lecture on Thursday, we'll also start doing some quizzes in class, right? Because I haven't really gone down with the breakdown of, of your grades yet, right? So most of your, about half your grade will come from your examination, from, from you know, big actual examinations, so two midterms and a final exam. As uh, there, You will be allowed a single sheet of, note, of notes, um, A4 or whatever the standard for Japan is, because that's different than A4. Or letter, so whatever your standard sheet of paper, that's fine. Front and back, that's fine. Printed, uh, or whatever. You can even do microfleche if you want. Um, so those are so microfleche. Like you'll need a magnifying glass for that. So uh, I, so long as basically the idea is that that uh, that programmers can do a lot with preparation. So the idea is that the act of creating the studying sheet means that you don't need a study sheet. Essentially, it helps. So you can refer to your study sheet a lot. Um, so those that should account. I think that accounts for like 50 to 60 percent of your grade. And then a good portion of it, another good portion comes from in-class exercises that we'll be doing. Uh, so quizzes that will be online. A good portion. So you'll get like 
basically quizzes every every lecture. Uh, these will be on mo online for the most part because they're easy to do that way, but also a lot of them will be participation based. So, or they might be a short in-class activity, which I just simply see that you did that and you get 100 on them. Uh, when I say the quizzes are participation grade based, that means that like, like anywhere between 20 to 60% of the credit, depending on the quiz, will be, will be just given to you for just taking the quiz, okay? So quizzes act double as participation. Um, so in other words, you know, short exercises that you will get credit for. Um, and then the rest of the uh, credit is, is your homework assignments. The, um, let's see. Yeah, what did I say our, our syllabus was? What did I say in our syllabus would be the grading format? Yeah, 25 for the assignments, 30% for his exams, 30% for the final, and 50% for the participation quizzes. Okay? Quizzes are not really meant to be stressful and they're meant to review what you already know. Also, they're also used as were you paying attention in class kind of deals. Um, and I have a schedule here. I think we got through pretty much most of what we needed to today and we'll see what happens uh, uh, tomorrow. I think actually we can get through, we can probably get through both of these tomorrow, to, on, on Thursday. And get ahead of schedule, but our first exam, I don't see a reason to have it before this stage, so I'm probably not going to move the exam date, right? No matter what happens, it's just going to be whatever's in the exam is going to be in the exam, right? And I'll have to figure out what I'm going to throw into an exam. Um, as you can see, I have got a lot of blank space here because Java, because Python goes by quickly, especially when you're doing things in class, but also more and more of our time will be consumed with actually doing stuff in class, like. The more, um, there, like if you've done programming before, I actually have a really nasty problem for if else's, which basically shows you don't actually need to make. It's not particularly nasty, but it, it it's tricky, even for me. But it teaches you really well. Uh, well, and there's, so we'll have basically, you know, exams like in that, around you know. Let's see, June 14th and in July, in July 10th. But that's, I think, where we can go from here. So there, because there's just a lot to do. Uh, Graphics-wise and game-wise, we'll see if we can, it, depending on how far we go, I might look up how to do Pi game and see if we transition over to that because games are also fun to do. But at the very least, with graphics, we're going to learn about turtle graphics, which are what I showed you at the, which I did very briefly at the beginning, which is, just dealing with very basic graphic kind of stuff. Okay. So I will help you get stuff set up, but for right now, I think we're pretty good with the lecture. I think we end in like 15 minutes. So let me terminate.